All right, welcome to uh, Gourmet Foods, everybody. This is um, going to be kind of our first lecture that you see in this format. I like to take a lot of video lectures and throw them on the canvas just so you can watch them whenever you want. So to kind of um, start wrapping our head around what this class really is going to be, there's some things that we need to understand about food just on a basic level. So what we're going to talk about today are the six basic principles of food science. And understanding how food reacts under certain conditions is essential to becoming a, a good cook. And from creating a flavorful dish to developing an innovative shortcut, chefs face challenges every day that revolve around their understanding of these six big concepts. Okay, so they are protein denaturation, uh, emulsification, gelatinization, caramelization, the Maillard reaction, and coagulation. So let's take a look at some of these. First one is caramelization. And that is the process of browning sugar in the presence of heat. Okay, this happens in the temperature range between 320 and 360 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very hot, right? And when sugar is exposed to heat, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to turn into a thick syrup, right? Like sugar syrup. Okay, and as this uh, temperature continues to rise, the sugar is going to evaporate water out of it if there was any water to begin with. Um, and it's going to change its color from a clear syrup to light yellow. And then progressively, it's going to get deeper uh, brown, right? It's going to be a deepening brown color. That browning process is the start of caramelization. Okay, so in addition to that color change, uh, the flavor of the sugar evolves and it develops this rich complexity that we know to be characteristic of caramel. Um, and that is oftentimes the flavor that you're going to get every time you taste that burnt sugar flavor a little bit. That's that caramelization process. Now, one thing we do need to understand is that the browning of like meat is oftentimes incorrectly described as caramelization. Remember, if there's no sugar involved, it's not caramelization. Um, some examples of caramelization, obviously this is a, a creme brulee where they're torching the sugar on top, making that, that crusty caramelized top. But a lot of other things, um, the most obvious would be just straight up caramel. Uh, that's just cooked sugar and then added with usually some cream and butter to it to make it softer. Uh, another one is like a meringue, right? Like a lemon meringue pie when it gets the uh, torched with a, with a little flame, it, it, it browns, right? And that's the sugar browning. And then one that's uh, less obvious is like meat that's been marinated in some type of liquid that has sugar is going to brown fast, right? And the reason it browns faster than normal is because of that sugar content in the marinade. So this right here is something like a, like a bulgogi in a Korean barbecue. There's a lot of sugar in that marinade. So as it cooks and as it's grilled, it's gonna char and get brown and bubbly. And that's from the sugar. Okay, so that's caramelization. The next process is gelatinization. And that's a process which causes liquid to thicken. Okay, and there are many ways to gelatinize a liquid. Uh, you can use starch, um, something like cornstarch or arrowroot or a flour based roux um, are all used for the same purpose of thickening a liquid. And there's a couple things we need to know when we're using starch as a thickener. Okay. Root-based starches, something like arrowroot or potato starch, um, thickens at a lower temperature, and it's not that strong of a thickening agent. Something that's a cereal base or a grain base, like uh, like cornstarch or wheat flour, um, thicken at a higher temperature, and they're a much stronger gelatinization agent. Okay, um, the only thing you need to consider when you're using a, a starch to thicken is that high amounts of sugar or acid are going to inhibit gelatinization, meaning that it's going to um, make it not work as well, right? But when, when it's in the presence of salt, salt is going to make a thicker uh, gelatinization. So, um, so just you have to be aware of the different components that are in your liquid and how that affects a starch-based gelatinization. The one that we're most probably commonly known for gelatinizing things is gelatin, right? Uh, it's in the name. So gelatin can also be used as a thickener, and it is a protein-based substance that's found in animal bones and connective tissue. So it's not vegetarian. It, it usually comes from pigs, uh, gelatin. 
And when gelatin is dissolved in hot, a hot liquid and then allowed to cool, it can be used as a thickener or a stabilizer. That's how Jello is made, right? It's made with gelatin. You can buy gelatin in the powdered form right there or in restaurants and in the industry, but we buy it in these sheets, right? And it's used the same way. You bloom it in cold water first and then you melt it into the hot liquid and then you cool it down and it makes something thick. The other category of things that can be used as uh, something to help gelatinization or, or gelification product would be something like agar agar, which is a hydrocolloid, meaning it's like a food safe powdered chemical or a powdered ingredient. Um, agar agar is a very common gelling agent. Uh, it's made from seaweed, so it can be used in um, in replacement of gelatin to, for something as vegan or vegetarian. And it works pretty much in the same way as gelatin would. Um, gelatin's a lot stronger and it makes like really hard gels. Agar agar make what we call brittle gels, but they still kind of look the same. Um, they just eat a little bit differently. So that's gelatinization. Coagulation, okay? This is, um, this is the curdling or clumping of proteins. And it's usually due to the application of heat or acid or both, right? Coagulation causes a change in texture and appearance in food because of the tendency protein has to bond together when it's in uh, heat or acid. So what you're looking at right now is the beginning of the teeth making process. So milk is a protein, has lots of protein in it. And when you add an acid to milk, the protein coagulates and all the solids clump together. And then you have the, the, uh, the whey. So the, the proteins are the curds and the whey is the other liquid left in there, right? So cheese making is a really good example of coagulation. Um, coagulation is a big part of protein denatur denaturation, which is something we're going to talk about in a little bit. But um, just think of coagulation is when, um, when proteins kind of firm up a little bit. Okay, that's coagulation. Maillard reaction. Now, this is the one that gets uh, confused with caramelization all the time. Maillard reaction is a complex browning reaction that results in the particular flavor and color of foods that don't contain much sugar. Okay. This reaction, which involves carbohydrates and amino acids, is named after a French scientist who first discovered it, Louis Camille Maillard, right? Um, but the Maillard reaction happens rapidly in the temperature range of 280 to 330 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a little bit lower temperature than caramelization. Um, but it's still a very hot reaction. When heated, the carbohydrates and amino acids in the protein react and produce numerous chemical byproducts, which result in that brown color and that intense flavor and aroma. Okay, it's this reaction that gives uh, distinct flavor to things like um, cocoa beans or coffee or like a baked good like bread or toasted nuts or seeds, roasted meats. That's what gives it this rich flavor. Um, so when we're searing a steak, it's not caramelization because there's no sugar, right? It's a reaction that's happening within the amino acids of the protein. That's the big difference. Okay. One thing to be consider or to consider, um, because water can't be heated above the boiling point, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is much lower than the range of Maillard reaction. Um, foods that are cooked with moist heat, things that are boiled or steamed or poached um, will not brown because they just don't get hot enough. And it's for this reason that anytime you see like a stew or a braised meat dish, um, the meat is usually browned before it's put in the liquid because that's the only way you're gonna get the flavor from the Maillard reaction. So if you know that smell when you're searing a steak or when you're roasting meat and you smell that really strong, intense flavor, um, that is, Maillard reaction. It is not caramelization because it does not have to do with sugar. That's one thing to really be aware of. Okay, this is the one that I said is similar or uh, has to do a lot with coagulation as well, but protein denaturation. Okay, this is the process of cooking proteins, meaning changing their texture and appearance through the application of heat, salt, or acid. Okay, those are the three big things. At a molecular level, natural proteins are shaped like coils or springs, right? When the proteins are exposed to heat, salt, or acid, they go from springs 
and they unwind into something more straight, right? And that's what denaturing is. The proteins are denaturing, meaning they unwind. Um, when proteins denature, they tend to bond together, meaning coagulate and form solid clumps. So that's why when something gets cooked or acidulated or salted, it firms up. That's coagulation happening because of protein denaturation. Okay. Uh, as proteins coagulate, they start they start to lose some of their capacity to hold water, which is why like really protein rich foods give off moisture as they cook. Okay, you do see that very often when you're sauteing a piece of meat or something, some moisture is going to come out of it. We can counteract that loss of moisture by cooling foods. So that's why like a steak, you're going to allow it to rest before it's being sliced. As the temperature falls, some of the juice from the steak is reabsorbed into the protein and the food becomes more moist. So that's why you allow um, a piece of meat to rest after you cook it. An example or some examples of protein denaturation is when you're applying heat to an egg, egg white, it turns from that transparent fluid to that white solid, right? So this is an egg white that has been coagulated from protein denaturization or denaturation through heat, right? Also through salt. Uh, if you've ever had prosciutto, it's not cooked at all, but it has a firmer texture than raw meat because it's been salted, uh, which extracts the moisture and denatures the protein, and then it's allowed to dry in the air as well. Um, oxygen is another thing that that uh, denatures protein, but it's not it's not a part of the big three, which is uh, salt, acid, and heat. Okay, and then the last one is acid, right? So if you ever seen ceviche before, um, it's, it's fish that's been marinated in like lime juice, and as that since lime juice is so acidic, as the fish marinates, it starts to denature the protein, meaning it. it changes its appearance, it changes its texture, it becomes more firm, it has a cooked texture to it, but it's never been uh, applied any heat to it. It's only because of the acid. So that's protein denaturation. And the last one's emulsification. And, um, and this is the process of combining two substances that don't normally mix, um, and you, you combine them into a homogeneous mixture. And a homo homogeneous mixture is known as an emulsion. Um, under normal circumstances, fat and water don't mix, right? But these two substances are the most common ingredients in culinary emulsions, an oil and a water-based thing. We combine them together and we make an emulsion. Emulsions are created by slowly mixing the two ingredients through like vigorous whip whipping or, 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 or shaking or stirring, right? We're trying to combine them together through agitation. Um, an emulsion can either be a temporary emulsion or a permanent emulsion. So if you look over here, this is like a vinaigrette, which is oil and vinegar. And if you shake that up, you'll get this, which is a, a temporary emulsion, meaning that it will separate over time. Um, but if you do agitate it really quickly, it will come back together. A permanent emulsion, something like mayonnaise, requires an additional ingredient added other than just the oil and water. Um, known as an emulsifier, also known as an emulsification agent. And that emulsifier is used to attract and hold together both the oil and the liquid. Okay. Common emulsifiers or emulsification agents are things like egg yolks, because egg yolks uh, contain a chemical called lecithin, which is an emulsifier. Things like mustard is a good emulsifier. Uh, Ingredients with natural starch, such as garlic, has natural starch, or you can use modified starches too, so things like cornstarch or arrowroot. Okay, and that's uh, that's how you make a permanent emulsion is by having an emulsification agent included, as well as the oil and the liquid. When a emulsion separates, it's referred to as broken, and it's kind of gross looking. It looks just like that coagulated milk, right? There's solids, and then there's liquids in there, and it's a it's a it's a gross mess, and and um. And there are ways to fix broken emulsions. Um, you usually do it by creating a new emulsion and then slowly mixing in the broken stuff into that until you have a stable and homogeneous mixture again. Um, but it doesn't always work uh, if you have too much broken stuff. So it is a, it is a process that is very delicate. Um, and examples of, of emulsions are things like mayonnaise, hollandaise sauce, if you ever had, oh, I'm covering it up right there. Look at that. 
um, Eggs Benedict has hollandaise sauce on top of it. That's an emulsion. That's egg yolks and lemon juice and butter, right? Um, those things don't mix unless you you do a proper technique to it and uh, and it gets it working for you. Vinaigrettes, just like I showed, are another emulsion. Uh, oil and vinegar, right? And then even something like butter is actually an emulsion because it's milk fat and and liquid and water, basically. Um, so when you heat up butter, it separates into the milk solids and the fat because, uh, because of that, because it's bound together. Okay? So all this information is in your study guide, and I don't expect you to understand all this right off the get-go. But I want to put it out there so that you understand um, the frame of reference of the things we're going to kind of talk about in this class. We're going to take those very basic um, things you learned in culinary foundations, and we're going to build on them with an understanding of the food science behind why things are happening. And if we understand these six basic principles, then all the cooking, cooking techniques that I teach you will be, um, you'll understand them on a deeper level. And we won't be going off recipes, we'll be going off techniques, right? Remember, you don't learn from a recipe, you learn from understanding the process uh, because of the food science, because of the technical aspects of it, and all those types of things. So that's what we're really going to learn in this class. Um, you will have a quiz based on this information. Remember, you can take the quiz as many times as you want, and you can use your notes. Um, so it should be a, not too difficult to get full credit on it, okay? But that's all I got. I'm going to post this on Canvas, and then I will see you on Monday.